Frank has covered everything. He has covered politics, he has covered Rome, he has been a restaurant critic, he is obviously now a columnist for the New York Times, and at almost every stop he has asked really big important questions, and he has typically come out of everything he's covered writing a book, which is more than most journalists can say. Um, his most recent book is Where You Go is Not, where you'll, is not Who You'll Be, um, which is about the madness of the college uh, entrance race, and that is just coming out in paperback, and we'll get a good chance to talk about the college admissions craziness. Um, and I assume that everyone here is going to want to, at some point, talk about politics. We're not going to start there. I know, right? I know. That's why, that's why I wanted to corner him, too. Um, but I don't want to start there. Um, I want to start by asking Frank, of all the stops he's made in his career, of all the beats he's covered, politics, Rome, food, having a column, education, which one has been your favorite? Um, does this work okay? We're good? Um, thank you all for coming tonight, by the way, and, and thank you for doing this. Anne and I go way back. We're extremely close friends. Um, we, uh, we've had interesting moments together. If there was a nanny cam on our friendship, it would be a, it would be a great movie. Um, <laughs> You know, I don't know which one was my favorite, but the one that I definitely get asked about the most, the one that everyone seems most fascinated by, was Restaurant Critic. I think just because, you know, there aren't that many restaurant critics in the world, it's such a, it's such a singular position, and, um, and people just seem most intrigued by it. So that feels to me like the, the thing that stands out is the most colorful. Mm -hmm. Well, and I have to be honest, having been friends, so Frank and I became friends during the George W. Bush campaign, the original one um, in 1999 and 2000, and through the recount and beyond. We, were, we spent a lot of quality time together in Crawford, Texas. Um, and so I've known him since then, and I will have to admit, it's a tough call for me which of um, your jobs has been my favorite, because although I loved it when you lived in Rome, and I got to visit, um, I did like getting to go eat in nice restaurants with you. Um, but for free. One of, we all got to eat for free. That's the important okay, part. Okay, for free. Yeah. For free. Um, yeah. Um, but one of the funniest parts about going to eat out with you when you were a critic was that you had to be anonymous. Can you talk a little bit about that and how hard was it to go in as someone other than yourself into a restaurant, in, mind you, in Manhattan, it, you yeah. know, somewhere where they're on the lookout for a critic? Well, you couldn't control whether they recognized you once you got there. But what you could ideally control, control was them not knowing you were on your way, them not knowing you were going to be eating in their restaurant until you sat down and they recognized you because they had all these ways of knowing what you looked like. Um, so. You know, I used fake phone numbers, I used fake names, uh, you know, to make reservations. Um, I was never very good at the fake names. So the hardest part of being a restaurant critic is the Rubik's Cube, the, the, it's Rubik's Cube, right? Yeah. The, of your schedule, because you have to eat in every restaurant you, you review three or four times before you review it. You don't want those visits to be closer than a week apart. You want to you review the restaurant at the 10 week mark. I mean, it becomes this arithmetical problem of when you make your reservations. And I was good at all of that, but I was really bad at figuring out what my fake reservation name was going to be um, until I was on the phone. I would just forget to make up the name. So in the beginning, it invariably ended up being a name that was on the spine of a book that was in view. <laughs> so they would say, and the reservation name is, and I would look around and say, Webster, Fodor, Frommer, <laughs> you know, Updike, Didion, you know, and on and on. And then I realized I had to come up with a slightly better system. So for a while, I thought, well, if I, <clears throat> if I use the same name for an entire week's reservations, that'll be OK, because by the time the restaurateurs recognize me and pass the information along, it'll be a new week, and I'll be on to a new name. And I would tend to use Italian surnames, since I'm Italian. Um, but here's how dumb I could be about this and how, how just the mistakes I would make. So I decided for one week, my surname would be Gentile. Um, which is a very common Italian surname, spelled G-E-N-T-I-L-E. -E. And when I look at that, I just see Gentile. <laughs> As fate had it, that week I dined in a kind of restaurant I didn't normally dine in. Um, and I showed up at that restaurant for my 8 p.m. reservation party of four. 
Um, and I walked to the hostess stand um, at this restaurant, an oat kosher restaurant. And I said, I'm the 8 p.m. party of four. And she said, oh, yes, you're the Gentile party. <laughs> Good, every time. Um, so what would happen when you were recognized in a restaurant, and how would they recognize you? Did they keep a photograph of you in the back? Were, they, were you wearing disguises? So in the internet age, um, and even more so now than when I was restaurant critic, but you know, everyone has a digital trail of photographs. So they would print out anything from the past. I mean, they would go to extraordinary, extraordinary lengths. I learned that the chef at Le Bernardin, Eric Repair, had not only kind of downloaded what pictures he could find on the internet, but he had um, seen a reference to a Nightline interview I'd done when we were on the Bush campaign, and he'd actually contacted ABC and gotten the footage and made his entire staff watch it so they would not only see what I looked like but hear my voice, see my inflections, whatever. Um, so they go through all of that. You know, they would, um, I would sometimes be dining in a restaurant and I could tell I'd been recognized, like the ions change, you know, or your server suddenly changes from the oldest, least attractive person to the youngest, most attractive person. Like literally in the middle of the appetizer course, all of a sudden you have an entirely new server. And sometimes I would look in the, in the entrance area and I would see all of these people walk in and then walk out. And what I learned is they had called nearby restaurants and said, if you want to get a glimpse of him in the flesh, you know, send someone over. But the best example of what would happen in terms of the way they would then kind of, you know, moon over you is I was, I was at a um, Nobu's successor. It was a restaurant called Nobu 57 in midtown Manhattan. And I think I was on my third or fourth visit there um, with two friends. We noticed early in the evening that our server didn't have a single other table. And when she wasn't attending to us, she was just standing 10 feet away, um, kind of eavesdropping and making sure nothing went amiss. And toward the end of the meal, I went to use the men's room. And when I was in the men's room washing my hands, I hit the soap dispenser really hard. And like a splotch of soap landed on my shirt. And I looked kind of ridiculous. So when I came back to the table, I said to my table mates, because I was embarrassed that I, I, you know, I said, ah, I got soap on myself in the, in the restroom. I hit the soap dispenser too hard. Um, moments later, the server brought us our bill. And she leaned over and she said, um, sir, I want you to know I've taken away your three glasses of white wine as an apology for the malfunction of our soap dispenser. <laughs> and, and I said, first of all, the bill was like $900 because we'd done omakase. So I thought, you know what, I'm not going to argue about the three glasses of wine. No one is going to say I was corrupted, you know, <laughs> by three glasses of wine on a $900 bill. So I just kind of said, you know, the soap dispenser's fine. I malfunctioned. I'm a klutz, whatever. You know, thanks. We're walking out of the restaurant, this very primly dressed man short man, like, you know, perfectly trimmed beard, nice suit, rushes up to me and says, sir, I'm the manager of the restaurant. I, I'm, I want you to know I am so sorry about the malfunction of our soap dispenser. <laughs> and I said again, like, your soap dispenser is fine. I hit it too hard. It's, you know, whatever. And then he, and he said, well, be that as it may. And he hands me his card. And he says, if your shirt needs to be dry cleaned or replaced, you know, I want you to call me. We'll take care of it. And at this point, <laughs> I said, said something to him I thought was kind of, I said, I think the shirt is going to be fine. It's soap, you know? <laughs> and then, and this is, my, this is my favorite part, like showing restaurant vanity. He then said, and it is Kiehl's. <laughs> oh, it's so good. So I, have, I want to ask you a little bit about how you think about writing about food. And, and I should say to all of you, we're going to have a question and answer session in a little bit here. Ronit and others are going to pass some cards. So please think about the questions you have on all these topics as we're talking, and we'll start um, including some of your questions. But when you think about writing about food, um, and when you first started thinking about how you write about food, how did you think of coming up with new ways to describe the tastes and were there certain things that you just don't like to eat or certain fads that you encountered along the way that you just thought were awful and you did not want to try, but you had to because you were a food critic? So I'm lucky there's very little I don't eat. Um, I, 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 and the things I don't like to eat, I can eat. I'm, I've never been a fan of anchovies. And in a sort of like anchovies light way, I've never been a big fan of sardines. But like other than that and insects, I'm game for anything. Organ meat, I'm fine. You know, brain. 
liver, bring it on. Um, but uh, I, I will tell you, the, the one thing that gave me pause was after I stopped being a restaurant critic, um, but I would occasionally write a food article, I went to the fabled restaurant Noma in Copenhagen. Some of you may have heard of Noma in Copenhagen. Um, and the night I went there, um, one of their appetizers was live shrimp. Now, you'll sometimes see on a sushi menu live scallop or this, but it never really means that. At this night at Noma, it literally meant live shrimp. And they brought me, it was served on this sort of sea rock, and they brought it to me and they said, and I said, those are moving. And they, I said, I said, what? They said, well, you, you put it in your mouth and you eat it, you know, like your teeth kill it. <laughs> And that was like, that was, and, and, and even then, I, so I, I, said, I, t I said to the waiter, I said, I tell you what, you do it and then I'll do it. And, and, and he did and then I did it, but I have never chewed so hard and so fast, I mean, before, anyway. But um, um, writing about food I think is really hard. Um, and I think you learn pretty quickly that you really can't describe well the taste of something, but you're not writing about food, you're writing about restaurants. And there's, as soon as you realize you're writing about restaurants and food is just a part of it, it's very liberating because you're writing, there's the theater of restaurants, there's the anthropology of restaurants, there's the sociology of restaurants. I mean, there's, there's so much there to write about um, beyond just the food and because and, you realize very soon, like there are only so many synonyms for certain things. And I swore that I would stop being a restaurant critic the 80th time I used the word succulent instead of tender or juicy. Um, and I think I broke that and it was about the 120th time that I used succulent that I stopped. How did you take notes while you were eating? Um, I got better and better at that as time went along. I would go to the bathroom and I would call myself. I would call my home machine or my work machine and I would leave myself a voicemail with my notes. And that way, um, Earlier, I'd gone to the restroom and I had um, uh, recorded myself. But then you get home and you worry about what if the recording fails, whatever. This way, like if you get home and you're a little tipsy, you know, your voicemails are waiting for you the next morning. You can just transcribe them the next morning and those were my notes. Brilliant. So uh, some of you may have read Frank's um, food memoir called Born Round. It's an excellent book. If you've liked his other work, I highly recommend it. Um, I want to ask you about that book and the writing of that book because that book isn't so much about restaurants as it is your relationship with food. How did you think of this book and what did it mean to you to write this much more complicated book than simply a bunch of food reviews or restaurant reviews at the point that you did? Um, well, I, you know, I wrote the book because I'd had such an unusual relationship with food in my life. I'd had a period in college when I had an eating disorder and there's something kind of remarkable, but remarkable about going from that to being someone who makes his living eating. Um, so I, I knew I had a story in there, but I think the main reason I wrote the book was um, I come from a very colorful Italian-American family and I'd always wanted some sort of vessel in which I could capture particularly my grandmother, my father's mother, my paternal grandmother, who was just such an amazing character, but also my mother. And I think the book at the end of the day is a valentine to the two incredibly complicated, powerful women in my life. And you write a lot about your family, both in your books and in your columns, and what those relationships mean to you. So I, I want to ask you about that a little more. Your father's mother was obviously Italian. Um, can you talk a little bit about her, the, the holiday rituals, what she was like, and how, what the influence on you was? Yeah, she was an amazing character. So she came to America when she was, I think, 14 or 15. I have it correctly in the book, but I forget it. Um, she was part of, a, a portion of her Italian family came over here. And she was brought with her brothers because she was the woman who was going to do the house cleaning and the cooking while the guys earned money to send back home. Um, and of course, she stayed here. She met my grandfather, who was an illegal Italian immigrant. But she was just so Southern Italian, so peasant. Um, you know, just she had she had such an attachment to kind of folklore and weird iconography. And and I always remember. Um, so Christmas at her house was a really fascinating thing. So for starters, she was so into ornamental stuff that in the front yard of their home in White Plains, New York, they, they had a manger that they put up right after Thanksgiving and didn't take take down until like New Year's Day. And when I say they had a manger, I mean it was enormous. Like my grandfather had to hammer it together. All of the figures, Mary, Joseph, were like nearly life-size, right? Ceramic life size. Like, like everyone in the neighborhood knew about it, but the best thing was it lacked baby Jesus, right? 
And on Christmas Eve, in addition to doing like the Feast of the Twelve Fishes and all of this sort of stuff, um, what would happen is a few minutes before midnight, she would dim the lights, she would put on like a record of Dean Martin singing Silent Night. It had to be Silent Night. And then like as if White Plains was on the same time zone as ancient Jerusalem, right? <laughs> she would, a minute before midnight, she would go into her bedroom where there was a special drawer of the dresser where a ceramic baby Jesus swaddled in linens spent the entire year <laughs> and she would deliver baby Jesus into the manger at the stroke of midnight and she would sob. And it was just, that's like, she was just such a character. Unbelievable, so amazing. Um, now, your mother was not Italian. No. Um, what was her relationship to this uh, big Italian family? And talk to me a little bit about her relationship to food. Yeah, so this is not a feminist fable, I must warn you. Um, my father was one of three boys, um, and uh, you know, all purebred Italian. Um, none of them married an Italian woman, which was a great sorrow to my grandmother initially. Um, and so as they each met and, and became engaged to and married their wives, um, their wives would go. My grandmother didn't have a single recipe written down. If you asked her how you made something, she'd say, well, you begin with a good piece of pork. And you'd say, well, a good, what is a good piece of pork? A good piece of pork, you know? <laughs> is that a pound? Is it two pounds? She didn't know. So they would go over and they would cook with my grandmother for several weeks because the only way to learn recipes was to actually watch her and to write it down. Um, and my mother loved food so much and turned out to be so much better a cook than my grandmother that that's what won over her respect. And it's funny because as my grandmother as my, accrued these daughters-in-law um, and each of them ended up making certain things better than she did, she retired those dishes from, from her rotation because she was not going to make anything that she couldn't make better than anyone else. But that was really her great pride, was that she had taught a new generation of non-Italian women to make a proper ravioli, you know? I'm so sorry I never got to learn it. Um, we're gonna come back to your mother in just a second, but first I wanna talk about one of your favorite, one of my favorite columns of yours, um, which was called The Myth of Quality Time. And in this column, you wrote about your family tradition of all 20 cousins, nephews, nieces, going on a week-long vacation together that your father organizes, and it's a week. It's a full week. And in the beginning, you described <clears throat> wanting to cut the trip, the trip short, coming a few days late, leaving a few days early. You like your, your space. You're not coming with small children. Um, but you go on to describe the difference that you found when you would stay for the full week. Can you talk about that and yeah. what those relationships in your family mean to you? Yeah, so I often wondered, um, you know, because modern life is crammed, it's fast, I often sort of, I used to question, like, why, why, do, why in my family do we insist on so much physical proximity time? Um, and during one of those recent vacations, it's, it's an entire week in late June or early July, every year we all pack into a beach house, um, and it's non-negotiable, you have to do it. Um, and one of the most recent ones, I was kind of sitting there, and over the course of a couple of days, I got into a, an incidental, spontaneous, serendipitous conversation with one of my nephews about what he really expected of college. I got into a similarly intimate conversation with one of my nieces, and I'm, I've, already, I've always been, and I already was close to them, but I realized that when you have this kind of notion that we're gonna have quality time for these three hours on Thursday night, you can't trust that you're going to be in the mood where an intimate conversation makes sense. You can't trust that somebody else is going to be in a sharing moment. The only way to actually kind of get all of those intimate moments is to be around long enough that when they happen, you're there. You, you can't force intimacy. You can't force candor. Um, and so I was thinking about that, and I was thinking this notion of quality time, that you just get out the calendar, and even if it's just six hours a week, those are going to be six quality hours. It's a lie because human beings can't be programmed to be candid, intimate, and sharing at a predetermined, pre-appointed hour. I love philosopher Frank. It's one of the reasons I love his column so much. Um, I want to come back to your mom and her views on college, and this leads to the book. Yeah. Um, talk to me about her, her fixation on the stickers. Well, yeah, so my book is an argument against the obsession with 
um, and the power attributed to only a handful of elite colleges. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it comes from research, it comes from anecdotal stories and all that, but definitely one of the things that attracted me to that subject matter and one of the seeds of it was the way I grew up. So I, I grew up in a Connecticut suburb where everyone was utterly obsessed with where their kids were going to college. The more exclusive, the better. Um, and the soundtrack of my adolescence, my teenage years, was my mother behind the wheel of the car reading the stickers off the back windshields of the cars ahead of her and, you know, because that's what you did in this suburb. As soon as your kids got into college, you, you rushed out, you got the sticker, and you put it on your back windshield. And so if you were driving around with my mother, she would pull up to a red light, you know, she would lean forward, and you would hear her reading, and she would go, Williams, Duke, Stanford. Oh, they did well, you know. <laughs> Seriously, or she would read a different lineup of schools and her whole body would tremble as if she'd seen a vision of her dark future. Um, and that was very much in my memory when I wrote the book, my mother's, my mother's suburban driving escapades. Well, let's talk about the book a little bit, and then I think we can start to take the, some of the questions down here soon. Um, why did you decide to write this book now? What were you seeing in young people that made you decide this had to happen? And tell us a little bit more about what you saw in some of the research. Right, well, so I mean, what I was seeing was, I mean, I live in Manhattan um, among very wealthy people who uh, try to you know, make sure their kids have the perfect childhoods. Um, my friends were all at an age where their children were, had just gone through or were just going through the college admissions process. I thought growing up as my mother's son, I thought it was pretty intense when I did it. I couldn't believe people were spending, oh, $60,000 um, to hire someone to tell them every step they should take from the eighth grade forward to maximize the chances of impressing a bunch of strangers in Cambridge or Palo Alto or, or New Haven or Princeton. Um, I couldn't believe all of that sort of stuff. Um, and the reason I couldn't believe it is because, like you, I mean, I've spent a long career in journalism interviewing and writing about extraordinarily accomplished people. And in my case, as you noted, I've done a bunch of different things. My little brother says I don't have a career, I have an attention deficit disorder. But um, because of that, the hundreds of successful biographies I had in my head are people across scores of professions and disciplines. And they do not all have fancy diplomas from fancy exclusive schools. Like, if you look at that sample set of people, they come from a diversity of educational backgrounds. So if that's the case, then why is there this belief and this industry and this obsession that your life is gonna be made or unmade by getting into this small set of schools? I just felt like somebody needed to note that contradiction, needed to call it out, um, and needed to explore why people think that way and give them you know, a reasoned argument why they can step off that freight train you know, and maybe take a more reasoned healthy, calm approach. What were some of the most extreme stories you heard in researching the book of the lengths students were willing to go to to get into the school of their choice? I mean, that's hard to say because there are so, so many of them. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you one that sticks with me just because it's, it's in the category of no humiliation is too great if it gets you into. So a professor at an Ivy League, a professor I came to know well at an Ivy League school was telling me about um, a visit he got not long ago from some relatives. He didn't know them super well, so he didn't know their daughter super well. He knew them well enough that they could say, can we come visit you? And they came to see him in his office with their daughter. They were showing their daughter. They were giving her the Northeastern Ivy League and Ivy-like school tour. Um, but they were really in his office, not on a fact-finding mission about that university. They were really in there, obviously, because they thought if he takes a shine to her, he picks up the phone or he taps out an email, you know, and says to somebody in admissions, I just met the most extraordinary young woman, we've got to have her here. And he said, so there was this sort of comical scene in his office where dad would say to the daughter, tell him about your SAT scores, and she would crow about that. And mom would say, tell him about your GPA, and she would crow about that. You know, dad would say, tell him about the third world country in which you did your charity work last summer. You know, and he said as it was going on, it was almost as if he could see like the dialogue balloon above their heads, you know, which was, does this sound as good as we hope it sounds? You know, have we rummaged deeply enough in the treasure chest of her charms that we've drawn out, like that we've pulled out and showcased every last shiny bauble? And he said at that exact moment, just as he was kind of thinking that, the mother turned to the daughter and said, do not forget to tell them how you're president of your high school survivors of bulimia society. So horrible. 
did she get in? But utterly believable. <laughs> um, so this is a good question that I think I'll interject and then I'll come back. I've got a few more of my own on this, this same topic. This is from somebody in the audience who asks, what do you think colleges can do to tap down the arms race that is now the admissions process? Um, there's a lot colleges can do, but I'm going to kind of answer that question by answering a sort of somewhat different question. I don't think colleges are going to do anything to tamp it down. Um, the power to tamp it down rests entirely with the consumers, meaning parents um, and kids. Colleges have learned that the marketplace rewards a low acceptance rate and that we all, um, for very debatable reasons, equate selectiveness and a low acceptance rate with educational quality, which is really cracked. We, we could talk all night about that. Until the marketplace stops rewarding schools for lowering their acceptance rate, which is something that's, that's, that you make a decision to do. It, it doesn't mean you're a better school. It means that you went whole hog after applications that much harder, because the only way to lower your acceptance rate is to raise the number of applications. And that's something that's a matter of devoting the public relations money and the man and woman power and all of that. As soon as the marketplace stops rewarding that, colleges will stop spending all the money and staffing to pursue that, um, and it will turn down the temperature in a big way. But until people stop behaving that way, colleges have no incentive not to kind of continue burnishing the myth of exclusiveness. And your argument is that it's actually irrational for parents and students to be this fixated on those schools if you base it on lifelong outcomes, right? It is irrational. I mean, if you base it on lifelong outcomes, I mean, when you, when you tell, when you send the message to your child that his or her life will be made or broken by a yes or no from a certain kind of school, and then that kind of school says yes, you've told your kid you may now coast. The rest doesn't matter because this was such a charmed moment. And I saw that, I, so I taught at Princeton about two and a half years ago. Um, I taught a writing seminar as a visiting faculty member. Um, I taught a food writing seminar because although it was really just about writing, they'd never had anyone teach food writing and I'd recently finished up as the Times restaurant critic. I was doing the op-ed column, but whatever. Um, and because it was labeled food writing, um, they had many, many more applicants than could be fit. There's a limit to these classes of 16. So they basically say to everyone, to prove your seriousness and to get into the class, write a letter of application. 48 students wrote long letters of application, and I know because I had to read through them all. Um, and they were really, really great letters. And I almost ended up choosing the 16 students for the class at random. Um, the semester began. About halfway through the semester, I'm downloading the latest assignments that I've gotten from the students, and I'm reading them with a sort of sunken spirit because they're disappointing me again, and I'm thinking, my memory must be shot because I think these students wrote better letters of application than any assignment they've written for me. And to see if I'd gone crazy, I went back, I had saved the letters, it turned out, I reread the letters of the 16 students who are now in the class, and easily more than half of them had never written an assignment as good as the letter of application. I was so blown away by this, I brought it up every time I got into a long conversation for the rest of the semester with a full-fledged, real Princeton faculty member. And I kept telling them these stories and waiting for the gasp, you know, of, of oh my God, I can't believe that. It never came, and to a person, every professor said, that's utterly unsurprising. These young men and women are here at Princeton in this era of a 7% acceptance rate here, 6% at Harvard, 5% at Stanford, because they're really good at getting into things and because they've prioritized getting into things and the message they've received from the college admissions mania is that the greatest accomplishment for which you summon your fiercest energy is getting through the door and what happens when you're inside the room matters far less. That, if that's really their thinking, that's gonna hurt and haunt them for the rest of their lives, and we haven't done them a favor, or their parents have them, haven't done them a favor by getting them into Princeton. If getting them into Princeton comes with that psychology, I think they've actually done them a disservice. Sure. Um, let me ask you about the paperback edition of the book. The, the book came out a year ago, and now it's out in paperback. Um, what did you hear from readers after the first edition came out, and what are the changes you've made to this update? Um, I made a lot of changes, not so much based on what I heard from readers, but when you, as you know, when you put out a book, you go out and you talk about it. 
Um, and you end up, in, at least in this case, I end up learning things I didn't know or, or getting even better examples of, of observations I'd made in the book. Um, some of them in this area, actually. In fact, there's um, a couple thousand words in the book that I added are about, um, about the Palo Alto area. And there's no better area to illustrate the mental health risks and the mental health consequence. No, I'm not being, uh, you know, so um, um, I, was so, I was so illuminated and saddened by some of the stuff I learned when I was out talking about the hardcover in this area that I'd say there are a couple of thousand words in the paperback that are, that are devoted to a portrait of this area as an illustration of some of the psychological risks and consequences of letting kids get too invested in the cult of perfection. But then there's also stuff I learned a lot about. Um, I, very few people are, are up to speed on the amazing honors colleges and honors programs that a lot of state universities have cultivated over recent years. And I knew about them and wrote a little bit about them in the hardcover, but I learned a whole lot more afterwards. And so I added that to the book. And it, it's stuff like that. That's great. <clears throat> OK, so I'm going to shift now to politics. Um, and um, one of Frank's early books is Ambling into History, which was a book that came after covering the 2000 campaign and talks a lot about the recount that led to George W. Bush being president. Um, we have a question from somebody in the audience who wants to know, what are some of George W. Bush's best qualities? Did you get the sense that he enjoyed his job as president? P.S. Go Heels. Somebody who knows your go biography. Heels? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to answer this, but then I want to hear your answer because you covered him too. So, I would, um, what are his best qualities? Um, um, he, at, I only knew him as a candidate. I didn't. I only covered his White House for seven months, um, and then I moved on to other things. So, I really didn't know him as president. Um, as a candidate, some of his best qualities: he's a genuinely warm human being. Um, would you agree with that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's a genuinely warm human being, and he's a genuinely unpretentious human being. Mm -hmm. um, I think those are compliments to him. Um, he is smarter than people realize, and to me, one of, the, one of the great mysteries of George W. Bush's political career, or rather of his decision to go into politics, is if you were talking to him in a group of four people, or if you were talking to him one-on-one, -on -one, he would often say things or simply hold a conversation that would have you, you'd walk out and you'd think, he's not the best informed human being I've ever met, but he's plenty smart. And then he would step up to a lectern. And a lectern is sort of the habitat of the presidency. And it would be his least eloquent, least articulate, dumbest version of himself. And it always blew me away that someone chose to, it's, it's like a fish choosing the temperature and the body of water in which it is, that's the least flattering to it. And that, is what struck me as the great irony of his political career. But what would you say? Well, that, and that was the origin of what became to be known as Bushisms. <clears throat> we used to keep a running list of his malapropisms on the campaign trail, and you wrote about some of them um, very eloquently. Um, but, but he's also very competitive, and I remember on one, at least one occasion his being somewhat competitive with you. Frank wrote a column at one point, I think it was before the New Hampshire primary, or perhaps it was right after he lost the New Hampshire primary, accusing him of not having the fire in the belly to be president. And uh, Bush took great issue with this, and then started keeping track of how much fire in the belly Frank had. Right, when um, I was missing from the campaign trail. When was yeah. he you know, not there at lunchtime, and did he really have what it took to be a political correspondent? So he turned it back on you. Um, I did get the feeling that he enjoyed being president, not so much because he um, necessarily enjoyed the, the day in and the day out, but the fact that he had won. I mean, he was very, I, I remember being in the White House press pool on the first night that he was, was president, after he had been sworn in and it was time to go to all the balls. And he came out of the White House and kind of looked around and saw all of us who had covered him on the campaign trail, and he doubled over laughing as though we were all sort of in on the joke. It was all pre-9-11. I think everything changed. Mm. It's a cliche to say it now, but his demeanor changed a great deal after 9-11. Um, I want to shift to the current campaign season and ask you what, you know, you've written a lot about the Republican Party, both parties, but, but especially the Republican Party over the years. What do you see happening? What is your explanation for this? Is it theater? Is there a fundamental rupture happening? And I'm not going to make you predict, but I'm wondering what you do see potential avenues being going forward. Um, well, what I think is happening largely is um, uh, I think 
a large number of people, not all people, have lost all faith in the political process and in Washington and in government and in the possibility that anything good or constructive can come out of it. And so I think a lot of the votes for Donald Trump are, pardon my language, but are, are what the fuck votes. You know, like, like how could it be worse than what we have? Um, I think, I think one of the, it's been, it's been talked about, but I think one of the insufficiently talked about aspects of Trump's success is the rebellion against political correctness. Um, I think a lot of people are tired of feeling uh, muzzled um, and like they have to kind of dance carefully across every word they say. Um, and even though they may not think Trump's going to be a great president, which I think he'd be an abominable president, um, that's sort of a, a gesture of support for him is a sort of um, thumbing of the nose at political correctness. Um, what I think is going to happen, I have no idea what's going to happen um, in the Republican Party. Um, it's very possible Donald Trump does not get a majority. That means an open or a contested or whatever adjective you want to use convention. I don't think any of us knows what would come out of that. But I think the whole process now and leading up to that means that unless something extraordinary happens um, or unless she proves to be even more politically clumsy than she's shown us yet, I think Hillary Clinton's probably the next president. So here's a related question from somebody in the audience to talk about the Democrats. Is there a realistic scenario, in your opinion, in which Sanders wins? Would he be an effective president? And this person has a part two, which is, what are your favorite New York City restaurants that are not well known? <laughs> I love how closely related these questions are. <laughs> um, I don't think there's any way Sanders can win. Um, I just don't think it's, I mean, mathematically, I guess it's remotely possible, but it's, it's mathematically a long shot, and I don't think it's going to happen. Um, so whether he would be a good president is going to be, um, it, it's, it's sort of irrelevant. I don't think he could be a very good president having nothing to do with him, but I just don't see any way um, in which he would be able to get a piece of the kind of legislation that would matter most to him through Congress. I mean, he may be right that his victory would signal, you know, the beginning of a movement, but the key word there is beginning. You know, I don't think you would immediately see a mirror of his victory in the composition of Congress. And so until that caught up, it would just mean utter, utter stasis. Um, I worry that it's utter, utter stasis no matter who's elected. And one of the things that really terrifies me right now about the campaign and about the general election that we could be looking at, say, if it's Hillary, Donald Trump, or if it's Hillary Clinton, Ted Cruz, I think this is going to be among the ugliest presidential campaigns we've ever seen. And the problem is um, each candidate tells himself or herself, it has to be this ugly for me to win. And that may be the truth. But the price of that ugliness is that you can't govern in its aftermath. So I really worry that for all we write and talk about how Congress gets nothing done now, I really worry we're looking at four years after 2016 in which it's even worse, partly as a consequence of what we're going to see this campaign become, devolve into. And to use the word devolve about this campaign, given the nadir it's mm -hmm. at right now, you know, but I'm really scared. I'm, I'm really genuinely scared about that. Well, this is a related, very good question from the audience. How secure do you feel American democracy is in light of the current presidential choices? And I would add the campaign as you describe it. I'm not very. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure. We're, I'm not going to say like a revolution or whatever, but I do think um, something's got to give at some point because this, this level of cynicism about the instruments of government, about the whole system, it can't last. And I don't see anything happening on the far side of an election as ugly as I envision that's going to redeem that cynicism. I'm, you know as much about politics as I do. What do you think? No, I'm here asking the questions. I, they're all here to hear you. That's called um, a cop-out. Well, I, I was actually, my mind had gone on to but the But do next... you disagree? Am I being too cynical or? Um, I, well, it, it, well, let me, the, where my mind had gone was actually to Europe and wondering if um, sort of deadlocked governing systems are the future. I mean, we've seen over time the p problems in Britain and in the UK and here sometimes tend to mirror each other. And obviously, Europe is having a great deal of trouble now governing itself and figuring out what kind of federation it wants to be, which got me thinking about your time in Italy, um, which I, I wanted to ask you about because we haven't really talked about that at all. You spent several years covering being the Rome Bureau Chief for the New York Times, and I'm wondering if you can reflect a little on the government there, the systems you saw in a much older society there, um, and how that struck you, and what it was that made you ready to come home at the end of that time. Well, well Italy was totally different because when I was there, and this has actually righted itself a little bit, but I mean, the government would change every 18 months. I mean, I, I used to have 
I mean, I used to have the paragraph on what we used to call save get key, you know, but the number of Italian governments in 50 years. And when I was there, Silvio Berlusconi was the prime minister. Um, and it's been so interesting to, to watch, and I wrote a column on this months ago, but to watch Trump's rise because it's so reminiscent of Silvio Berlusconi. Um, I mean, so, so, so reminiscent of that. Um, uh, I lost track of the question. I think, well, I, I wanted you to reflect on your time in Italy, which also had good food and good yeah. politics. Um, but, but when you were, when it was time to come home, were you ready? Did you want to stay longer? How did it feel to live in oh, Italy versus I, living I wanted, here? I wanted to stay longer. What happened was I'd been in Italy almost two years, um, and I didn't know... Um, in our, at the Times, there's a tradition that you, you cycle out of a foreign posting every four years. Um, and if you're in a really miserable place, often it can be six years. But if you're... <laughs> But if you're in Rome, it's like three and a half years because there's so many people chomping at the bit to take your place. So I was nearing the two-year mark, and I was, because I'm a sort of worrier, I was already sort of wor worried about the fact I had no idea what I wanted to do next. And at that moment, someone in New York had the kind of crazy idea of like, what if you were our next restaurant critic? So I left Rome way before, and Italy way before I wanted to because I couldn't have said no to that then and had that job waiting a year and a half later. And it sounded like such an adventure. Um, it solved the problem of what I would do next. And so um, I wish I'd gotten more time in Italy. I found living in Rome to be as frustrating as it was enchanting, but I found covering Italy, like having a profession, not just a professional reason, but a professional obligation to explore Italy um, was awesome. I mean, and I got to see much more of that country than I ever would have been able to, even with repeat visits as a tourist. And I do love Italy a lot. This person in the audience wanted to ask the very question of how you got into the restaurant review business, which you just answered, but also asks, um, did you start with a college major in journalism? Why don't you talk a little bit about what got you into this in the first place? Oh, yeah. No, I didn't. Actually, I, I didn't major in journalism in college. Um, so when I was in, in high school, I went to a prep school, but I was a day student. Um, I wrote for the prep school literary magazine, for the prep school newspaper, and I knew I liked to write, but I never thought like that would be my career. Um, and then I went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill on something called a Moorhead Scholarship, and um, when I got there, they had a fantastic student newspaper that I gravitated to mostly to kind of the way someone might join a fraternity. It was like I needed a center of gravity, I needed a, a bunch of people who I could get to know really quickly. Um, and I worked on the Daily Tar Heel, but it was my belief then, and I sometimes wonder like how I kind of thought this way at a young age, because I actually think I was right. I thought, I can learn journalism in the doing if I decide to do that. I can, I can learn it on the job, but I can never have like a full-fledged liberal arts humanities education once these years are gone. So even though Chapel Hill, unlike a lot of Ivy League schools or private universities, even though they have a journalism school in which you can major in journalism in undergrad, and many people do, and almost everybody at the Daily Tar Heel was a journalism major, um, I didn't take a single journalism class in college. Um, I thought I want to spend that time taking English classes, which was my major, taking history classes, that sort of thing. But as college ended, I had done journalism internships during the summers. And as college ended, I realized I had never come up with a professional plan um, and that people did make their living doing this journalism thing. Um, so I did that. We have a couple journalism questions in here. Um, but I want to ask this question about the Catholic Church. <clears throat> Tell us where you think the Catholic Church is going with Francis at the helm. And this comes from Pat Palazzolo. Did I say that right? Palazzolo? It says real name. Paisana. There you go. Fellow Italian. Um, where the Catholic Church is going, um, I mean, it's nothing, I mean, Francis, Pope Francis has been a much um, more interesting and I think admirable Pope um, than several of his predecessors, but I don't think he's reversed the general trend in the Catholic Church, which is that it's, be, which is that it's becoming a third world church. And in the first world, people's relationship with the Catholic Church is a very kind of selective, picky, and distant one. I mean, most Americans, most Western Europeans, um, Catholicism for them is more of an ethnicity than it is a creed that they feel they need to live by exactingly. Um, and I don't think anything about him has changed that, but I think he has made people um, who feel a, especially Westerners, who feel a regard um, for the soul, you know, and the greatest principles of the Catholic Church, he's made them feel more comfortable with their Catholicism because he has sent various messages and spoken a language that says, um, you have as much of a place here 
um, as somebody else, even if you are divorced, even if you use birth control, um, you know, even if your life does not, ex does not conform perfectly um, to the formal teachings of the Catholic Church. Um, and I think that's been a great relief and blessing and kindness. So in contrast to the populism of Francis, we have a number of questions in here about your rest time as a restaurant critic, wanting to know about how one can rack up a $900 bill, why some restaurants are so pretentious. So, several people have asked about this. Can you talk about the Manhattan restaurant scene? I mean, it does, when I've gone to dinner there, it does certainly evoke a sense of the inequality that we all talk about to yeah. see what some of the meals are like. What have you seen in the extreme and were there ever times when it would offend your sensibilities? Sure, I mean, um, but, I want to push back on that a little bit because actually the great trend in restaurants when I was a critic, and it's continued, is that for every one um, temple of fine dining that opens up and that involves you know, a bill that's going to end up being with tax, wine, and tip $250 or more a person, um, the really interesting thing that happened, that's happened in the food scene over the last 20 years is the number of chefs of great um, accomplishment, ambition, um, creativity, who've decided to work in an economically humbler vein. I mean, they're not ending up, I mean, they're not taking vows of poverty or whatever, but what I mean is they're, they're taking foodstuffs that you would not have considered um, great vehicles of ambition and creativity, um, and they're investing them with a whole lot of imagination, and these are things for which you can only charge so much. So, I mean, a perfect metaphor for this is there's a there's a, a cocktail lounge that was that became very popular while I was restaurant critic um, called PDT um, in the East Village and PDT the initial st stood for please don't tell and the bar was <laughs> this sounds so Superman but um, to a to access this cocktail lounge you went into a place called Criff Dogs which was a kind of scruffy hot dog shop in the East Village and you had to know to walk to the phone booth and pick up the phone and then a door opened and you went inside. Um, within PDT, which was, a, which was at the kind of forefront of the classic vintage cocktail movement, um, the menu was solely a menu of hot dogs as interpreted or done by David Chang, I forget, by, by Wiley Dufresne, the chef at W, you know. But, but it was a perfect example of what was happening more and more when I was restaurant critic and since, is that chefs wanting to strut their stuff have often done it in humble settings um, and with types of food that you normally didn't associate with that. Story.